It's time for another episode of The Sean Tappet Show, a podcast where I connect you with thought leaders from across the globe, digging into some of my favorite topics like personal development, marketing, spirituality, and pretty much any other shiny object that happens to catch my attention. Today, my very special guest is Jamie Lynn Walnow, and we're going to be discussing her new book, Holy Revolution, Finding True Satisfaction in a Life Set Apart. Jamie Lynn, it is truly an honor. Welcome to the show. Love to be here with you, Sean. Good to see you. Now, in the circles you and I both run in, we know all the same people. So all of my friends are generally your friends, but I know there are still going to be people who watch and listen to my podcast who have not had the pleasure of meeting you yet. So let's kick this off by having you share a bit of the Jamie Lynn Walnow origin story. Tell us about your special abilities, your superpowers, all the things. What are, what are some of the things we absolutely need to know about you? Absolutely. Well, thanks for having me. Nice to meet all of you who are tuning in. Um, it was a warm summer day, July 31st, 1987. No, I'm kidding. Um, I am a twin and I, I don't know what it's like to not be a twin. I've shared life with somebody my whole life, everything. And it's been awesome. And I, I have always loved the Lord since I was a little girl. I'm not one of those people that has, I used to really feel like I didn't have a testimony, but my testimony is I grew up in a believing home and I grew up having a relationship with God. Even when my church didn't teach relationship with God, it's just a supernatural life. I'm not saying that I was perfect in any capacity, but I'm saying I genuinely loved the Lord and had dialogue with him all the time. So my upbringing looked a lot like that. Went and got my master's degree in communication. I really love higher ed. I don't think everybody's called to it. So no pressure to anyone out there. I just think you need to be led by God. And that rocked my world. And coming out of grad school with pride and entitlement and all of the things that, you know, I came into agreement with, with my higher education, um, I started attending Upper Room Dallas and really laid down all of my dreams to follow the Lord, became a children's pastor, met my husband. We had a long journey to the altar, but we got married. And my whole passion through laying down my life and my 20s and laying down my dreams to follow what God's dreams were for me in that time produced a lot of character, produced this book that I wrote and led me and my husband to getting married. And I am super passionate now. This is like such a bullet point answer for me, by the way, but I'm super passionate about us going into the world, living the great commission and making disciples, but in every sphere of influence. Um, but there's only one way to do it and it's God's way. And so I'm very passionate about empowering the bride to be set apart so that when you go into entertainment, media, education, and medicine, whatever you're going into, however many mountains you want to say, that you don't compromise and that you truly are able to accomplish all that God desires, all of the gifts, all of who he created you to be with all of God to go transform culture. And so that's what makes my heart burn with passion is to teach people to hear the voice of God, to be in prayer. And that relationship will catapult you into transforming culture, wherever that may be in your home, um, where nobody can see you all the way to, you know, you know, like a, the next Ellen DeGeneres, whatever you're called to be, but as, as one who doesn't compromise. So that is Jamie Lynn in a nutshell. And I love my husband. I could go on and on about that, but that's, <laughs> if you follow me, that's a given. You'll see that. Yes, if, if you want to stay up to date on how wonderful Jamie Lynn's husband is, follow her on social media. You'll get all the important updates related to that. <laughs> um, you know, Now, I'm always curious when people express themselves in one medium and transition into another. So you're a very creative person, <clears throat> excuse me, very artistic. Talk to us about kind of your, your passions creatively, artistically. And then what was it like to channel that into writing? Because it's a different way of expressing yourself writing a full book is a whole, especially your first book is a whole unique journey unto itself. So tell us a little bit about your creative life and what it took to channel that, focus that into writing. That's such a good question. So I took four years of art in high school because they put me in art my freshman year. And I went to the office and asked them to remove me from class. And they said there was no other option, which led me to taking three more years of art in high school. That's the only training I've had. And I remember I went, you know, I went and got my, my master's degree and my mom always thought you should get an art degree. And I'm like, no, you can't do art for a living jokes on me. Cause I definitely ended up doing that full time in my twenties. 
and, and essentially now in a way, but um, it's the one thing I've always fought with God on, like internally, it's this battle of feeling like being a painter wasn't enough because my dream is to have a TV show and to preach the gospel and, you know, all over the world. Like I want to see souls like saved and set apart. I want to see people run to the altar and lay down drugs, lay down addictions, lay down what, you know what I mean? But in the meantime, to produce character, God led me to painting full time. And it's the one thing, if you're creative, I want to say it is a battlefield because God is creative in the one area that the world takes out and tries to, the enemy will infiltrate the most is creativity. It's the arts, it's entertainment, because art is so moving and it's so powerful. The first thing God did in the book of Genesis was create. And we're made in his image and we're called to create and Satan hates that. So I just want to say for anyone who's, who's battling that you're not alone. It's like well over a decade of me creating and I still battle that like with the Lord. So, you know, I started, I was the children's pastor at upper room before that I was painting full time, which led me to building a children's ministry at upper room, which then led me to um, painting again full-time, which actually provided an income for me to do media part-time. So I was doing art part-time, like 20, 30 hours a week. And then I was able to do media 10, 20 hours a week without getting paid for that and sewing into it and building that. Um, So it's amazing how God brought provision for me, but it was not without discipline. And then writing a book, Um, the first thing the Holy Spirit ever spoke to me when I was in college and I just discovered it's like, you know, the Holy Spirit was given a name. I always thought it was a Catholic thing. I always thought like that was just for Catholics, the father, the son, the Holy Spirit. Um, but when, when I met like the name and what I had been like the one I had been, that had been talking to me as a child growing up, everything just changed and collided. And the first thing directly I heard from the Holy spirit was that I would be a writer and a speaker. And it wasn't like this cute, like, Oh, one day you're going to be blah, blah, blah. It was like, no, you are a writer and you are a speaker. And it hit me, which is why I went on to do communication like I did for my degree. So when it came to writing, you know, I could have written a book right then when I heard it, when I was 18, or no, no, when I was like 19 or 20 and I'm 34 now. So I could have written, I could have written the book then, but I don't know that I would have pointed everybody to Jesus through the pages. I don't know what it would have been like. It might've been great for them. Might look back and be embarrassed. You know, God can use anything, but, um, all of a sudden, you know, I have an encounter with the Lord a few years ago and that encounter produced the message and having lived the message for a few years, I was released to write this book. So writing this book, my goodness, I can't wait to write another one. Like I know what I was made to do and it's to write. And I'm so glad I wrote a thesis in graduate school to understand the discipline it takes to write. And it's like, God prepared me all along. I wasn't just like this crazy creative that couldn't, you know, do, I'm not a stereotypical artist, you know? And it's like, God trained me then writing a thesis, which is honestly harder (laughs) because you're not allowed to give your opinion at all. It's all like factually based. It's not like your story. You can't write your story, which I'm not anyways. So all this to say that was harder. And this was just like amazing. And I learned the value of writing from encounter because a lot of it was written from like, you know, just being so moved by God and writing like what he's done for me and like in his word, how amazing his word is and the hunger that I have. And then there were times where it was like, this just has to get done. And this is me being obedient and watching a video you guys did destiny image with Bill Johnson. He was like, writing from obedience is just as powerful as writing from encounter because you're following the Lord and you're doing what he's called you to do. And so that gave me, you know, it wasn't like swirly swirlyville, like grad school grounded me as, um, as a, like a scholar, as one who, you know, like the logical side and my faith, you know, it's like the swirly, awesome, spiritual and logical collided in the writing of this. And I loved getting to use both sides of my brain. I want to get back to the encounter that sets you down the path, defines the journey for this book. Uh, But first I want to finish rounding out the origin story 
And I'd love for you to share who are some of your influences. Obviously, I know Patricia is a big influence in your life. She wrote the forward for the book, but who are the men and women who poured into you, you know, in that interim period between, you know, 18, 19, when you get a word about writing a book? Um, I'm glad you waited till now because I expect you matured and grew up and just had had experiences that made this book so much more than it would have been if you tried to, you know, tried to write the uh, tried to write this 10 years ago. So who are some of the core influences that poured into you in that interim period to get you really ready to write this book? Well, my parents are my spiritual parents. And um, I would say my mom introduced me to the Holy Spirit. And she's just always believed in me and always spoken life into me. My dad's also always believed in me. And there were like, there was like a, a good time chunk where my dad and I weren't super close. And that was hard for me from a spiritual standpoint and everything changed, you know, several, several years ago. And I'm so grateful for that moment when everything changed. And so my parents are a huge influence. Of course, Patricia King is just, I could say so much about her too, from a, from like what she does and what I'm called to do. I find so much stake and, you know, it's like, it's, it's watching somebody fully and completely do in a way differently what I'm made to do holy and pure and humble and, and without holding back. And then I would say my husband is, um, challenges me to be holy by the way he lives. Um, when nobody's looking his discipline in the secret place and he doesn't stop. And then at upper room, my goodness, I, I could just list everybody that I grew up in front of. We all grew up in front of when you build a church with people, let me tell you, or I would say, I, I would probably call it a house of prayer more than a church. But when you build a prayer room with people, like I'm telling you, you just iron sharpens iron, you know, the Michael and Larissa Miller, Meredith and Michael Malden, who did our wedding, um, Katie Pastel, who was on staff with me and all of these amazing men and women, Peter Lewis, my goodness. I mean, I could keep going and I feel bad because I probably would leave people out, but all that to say, like we were in it together and we learned to follow the Holy spirit period. Like we didn't put the bells and whistles on a church because it's what culture said. We weren't allowed to be on media. We weren't allowed to have a website. The first five years we started, people would just find us and we began to discover Sorry. We, Keep going. That's this is real life podcasting. When yes, guys, we uh, live we live <laughs> underneath the airport practically. You can hear all the planes and all the cars like to speed on our street. Um, yeah, but I I would say um, I forgot what I was saying. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Uh, you were talking about key influencers at Upper Room and uh, talking about just all the all the things that you guys weren't able to do in those first yeah. five years, really. So God can draw in the right people in that season. Yes. Yes. And I learned, I learned by watching and being a part of something with community, the value of community, running with people, building with people who aren't like you, but who, who carry the same heart and vision, the value of running with people who have the same vision. And so I just feel like upper room totally changed and rocked my world because of the people God put around me and around us. And I'm just forever, forever grateful. I feel like my wedding was an upper room wedding, <laughs> like, because that's, that's all we need. I mean, it's amazing what God has done. And so that produced character in me to run alongside people who weren't afraid to call me higher, to sharpen me and to receive it on the same end for me, like family running together. So I, I could, I could keep going. I mean, biblically, clearly there's amazing people who transformed it, but the people who are living and breathing, those are the ones who come to mind the most. All right, now let's get back to the encounter that sets the trajectory, starts you on the path for this book. What'd that look like for you? I was directing a conference at Upper Room Dallas. I was I directed all of the, the conferences at the beginning um, for the first several years that we did them. And um, we, I was not expecting to encounter the Lord like this. I was directing the conference. However, I encouraged all the volunteers to be a Martheri, where we took the best parts of Martha and Mary, and we would set the table with the gift of hospitality for Jesus to come. But when he came, we would submit to him. So like, I use this example all the time and it's in the book too, but if you were called to work the t-shirt table 
and you were experiencing the man Jesus, do not move from that place and go work the t-shirt table. Like it was a family conference, like encounter Jesus. So somebody, somebody who had never prayed for healing before in a session came to the front and it was all about healing. And, um, so somebody had a word of knowledge for a girl named Sheila with flat feet. Nobody was in the room, but then a friend called and a friend ran to the front and said, Hey, this is Sheila. She has flat feet. She's on the phone. They put her on speaker. The guy who had never prayed for healing before prayed for her. She had to pull over her feet were on fire and she had arches in her feet. And she came the next Sunday to show the arches in her feet. And it's just crazy. I felt the Lord so strong. I mean, it's flat feet arches being formed in flat feet. I've seen crazy miracles. I went to Mozambique with Heidi Baker. You just see crazy things happen all the time. Like we saw cool things. I had experienced healing myself. Like, but for some reason, the Lord came in this moment and he presented an opportunity. He said, do you want to direct the conference or do you want to encounter me? And I knew if I said yes to him, it was not going to be cute and it was not going to be pretty because I could feel all the emotions behind my eyeballs (laughs) and buzzing through my body. So I ran to pray for a man who had cancer and he was just at the tail end of his life. And I had the craziest encounter weeping at his feet um, that I feel is something I get to treasure for the rest of my life. And, and it was so real. I had another, the Lord presented again, do you want to keep directing the conference or I have more for you? And I got up and I sprinted to my friend, Michael Malden's office. It was just the closest room laid on the concrete floor and wept for hours, like three, four hours. I don't know how long it was. It was into the next session. Mind you, I was the director of the conference. And for that time, he shook everything that wasn't wholly out of me. And he gave me a new heart. And he said, he said so much in it, which is all you need to go. Actually, this is like the plot twist. So many amazing things happened from that encounter. They're in the book. So you have to go check it out. Um, but it changed my world. And I lived that message and things unraveled after this encounter that he didn't speak to me about, but he did like, he didn't speak to me directly about in the encounter, but my life was changed from the encounter after that. Um, and so it just, you have to read the book to discover. I mean, it is, it is, I've been, I, everything in this book, I live, um, I'm not, I'm not giving you ideas. I'm, I don't like going to conferences where people give you ideas and you, you walk away without solutions or tangible ways. Cause I think God is very practical in many ways. Um, so all this to say that changed my life and here we are. Well, and from a marketing perspective, I love that that is kind of a teaser for why people need to read the book. That's, that's perfect. Great, great job marketing the book. Um, and in, uh, in terms of hindsight, like so often we'll have these encounters and we know some of what God's doing, what God's speaking in the moment, but I feel like it's as we look back or I find is especially people who are close to us, our spouses, our parents, like they're like, what, what in the world happened? Like something like they, they noticed something dramatically shifted before we even uh, fully realize it. But yeah, it's definitely in, in hindsight that these things uh, seem to make more sense. And I forgot where I was going to go with a follow-up question. So I'm just going to keep moving through, through my outline. Uh, you know, I could make a list of probably 10 to 15 men and women age 20 to 35 right now who God has marked for a call to holiness and reverence. And and not to say that people in my generation older that we aren't going after or calling for those things, but there's something unique on these younger generations that God is pouring into them. And I feel like you're, those two generations, the millennials and the Zs, are actually speaking up to us in some of these older generations. So I'm curious, uh, from your perspective, why is God doing that? And like, why, why is this message like uh, being ignited in the younger generation, uh, as opposed to, cause it, it's, it's, people aren't pushing back up on it in the older generations, but I feel like the fire is being stoked, uh, amongst the younger folks. So where's that coming from? I think we just want the real thing. Our generation, we always love the preachers who are like, man, I messed up. And this is where I messed up. And then I realized I'm a child of God. You know, like you hear Patricia, she's like, I was sick and I was feeling sorry for myself. And I was wondering if I was dying. And then I was like, wait, I felt the Holy Spirit tell me you have dominion. And she like preaches this stuff. And, 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 you know, it's like, we, we love the real thing. We want to know, like, it's, it's not because we celebrate your imperfections. It's because we have seen the religious spirit and it makes, it makes us sick. Like we don't, we can't, we, our generation will not follow God 
if a religious spirit is involved, because the moment we find out whatever we've been following was being led by that spirit, it's like trust was broken or something. And so our generation has, there, there's these, there's this remnant that has we're diving into the word and we're recognizing what's happening in our culture. Our culture is trying to define the word of God and that's not real and that's not okay. So the word of God shows us what culture should be. The word of God defines culture. So you have these men and women who are rising up to, to challenge the status quo and say, this is not God, but this is God. And there's a way, but I can't transform every sphere of influence. So how can I gather my brothers and sisters to see the truth to hunger for the truth, to desire for the truth so that we can go and make disciples in all nations. So when we get to heaven, there's an army behind us and there's an army behind every single one of the people that we brought in because we lived the great commission. It's just showing up on a Sunday isn't enough. Drinking um, to numb out on feelings or socially, it's just not, it's not satisfying. It's like the only, the only thing that satisfies even my flesh is the man Jesus. I, I've tasted, I've seen a little bit of this and that, and the only thing that satisfies is the real thing. And so, you know, we don't carry the fake designer brands. We carry the original. We, we carry the original. And I've never said that before, but that was really cute, Holy Spirit. I like that. I don't know. It might be too much for a t-shirt, but it, it certainly uh, belongs somewhere. And, and I would encourage, you know, I'm in a unique position that I work with authors. I get to interview people. Um, but if, if you're uh, a parent, a grandparent, some, maybe, maybe you're an older sibling, um, talk to some of the younger folks who are up and coming that you see preaching and teaching and in interesting places and ask about their journey. Um, I've been really impressed with some of the folks I've met in the last couple of months who are in their early twenties and you start just kind of pulling on the strings and asking about their journey. And they're like, well, when I was 13, God impressed on me to set myself apart and just walk this holy line, even though all my friends were doing this, that, and the other thing. I, I stayed away from drugs and drinking and didn't have sex before marriage and uh, didn't listen to any kind of secular music. And I'm, I'm finding that more and more there's this like remnant that God has set aside amongst these younger generations where they've actually been walking in extreme holiness and reverence from the time they were in their early teens. Yeah. Um, not that we haven't seen that in other generations, but it's something unique that I'm seeing more and more as you encounter these men and women who are moving greatly under God's power in their early twenties and into their thirties there's some kind of a marker in their past where God said, I'm going to set you apart, but it's going to cost you something. It's going to look like something. And so um, I think we're going to hear more of those stories and those testimonies coming out. But um, yeah, for people you see moving, start asking questions. At the very least, it will encourage you. I think it will certainly challenge you. Uh, so yeah, pe- people like to share their stories. So yeah. why not ask? See, see what they have to say. Um, Wait, we Go ahead. Something? Yeah, yeah please. Yeah, please do. I love what you just said. I want to say that is my story. And I wasn't perfect along the way, but because I was a child and I grew into, into that message. But if you're listening, that can be your story. Like right now, um, it's your history. God wipes the slate clean. When you turn to him, when you repent and repentance is key, when you turn your heart to him and you repent, some of the most evil leaders in the old Testament, like I was like, wow, you are evil when they genuinely turn the heart to God. He renewed everything in their life and restored everything because of the posture of the heart. So if that's you and you're like, man, I have a really dark past. I didn't have anyone to show me that. I didn't hear the Holy Spirit when I was younger. Literally from this moment for it's possible. Well, and, and I want to pull a little bit on that thread of, of Jesus wiping our slate clean. Um, so I was just in Charlotte this week uh, taping for Sid Roth with my good friend, Randy Kay. He's got a new book called Revelations from Heaven. And during the interview, he's sharing with Sid about how uh, when he was in heaven, he had a life review, which is very common for people who have these near-death or afterlife experiences. They'll often experience a life review where they'll encounter things both good and bad in the life that they had lived thus far. Yeah. And Randy talks about how when he came back, he could remember all the good aspects of life review where Jesus said, you know, this is, I was really pleased when you did this. He has no, He knows that Jesus reviewed things that were not okay, that were some of the dark places of his journey. He literally cannot remember any of the things um, that he saw in that life review uh, that were of that nature. And he prayed about it. He's like, God, I, I remember vividly everything else from my heaven encounter. And God revealed to him. He said, you know, those have been wiped clean. They're gone. That's why you can't remember them. Yes, they were part of your life review. And you know, you saw them, but the reason you can't remember them is because they're gone. And so um, that was like one of the first like 
super concrete times. I've heard that illustrated in somebody's testimony. So Randy K, Revelations from Heaven, wow. it, it'll encourage you. But um, so, you know, we often think about those things, but that's like a legitimate, tangible example where somebody experienced that. So uh, I don't mm-hmm. know who that's for. That's to encourage somebody. So uh, we live in an age of distraction. Uh, I would say we're, di- we're di- between social media and streaming this, that, and the other thing. We're just distracting ourselves to death. Talk to us about overcoming distraction and maybe in choosing God, choosing God's presence over distraction. How, how do we balance that? Because we literally, I know people who are just distracted all the time and they're, they're living off in the corner and they never experience life, let alone God's presence. Yeah, it's so real. I mean, I look at the, even Gen Z is, we didn't have social media when I was in high school and really, I mean, college, we had Facebook. But um, we, we did not have the the apps that all these young people have. So I just want to even encourage those who are older, who are listening to have grace and kindness and love and compassion towards these young kids who are literally every single day being, this is the distractions are being thrown in front of their face. And we're having to disciple a generation that's going through something we did not go through. And many adults, don't get me wrong, they go through it. I mean, goodness, you just get hooked and you get addicted and there you go. But um you know, I have a hard time when I hear people say, you know, like I'm struggling with this and I went to church and God didn't undo it for me. God didn't deliver me from it. And I'm like, did you go to a church where God was? Because church doesn't mean anything to me on the outside of a building and it can keep us in our distractions, but God wants to encounter people in their room by themselves. You don't have to have a group of people around you, but if you you are hungry and you're crying out for him. It's a promise in his word. He will answer. And even for people who are easily distracted and you feel called to media, I put a 15 minute timer and I, and I do social media for other people as well, but I have a 15 minute timer on my Instagram account. So I have the choice to continue for one more minute to continue for 15 more minutes or to continue for the rest of the day as much as I want to. But it gives me a loud choice. It's like, you know, when God is like, you're going to choose me in this moment, or are you going to choose something else? It makes it that clear of a distinction of my time per day that I'm putting towards something that can, that has been a distraction for me in the past. So for you, protect all places around you. Ask the Holy Spirit. He will reveal to you, Holy Spirit, where am I distracted? What, what's going on? Where am I distracted? Because I don't want anything to come before you. If we aren't getting filled with his word and we're not actually in relationship via prayer and worship, listening to him, not just talking to him and telling him everything we need. He already knows what you need, but he wants to tell you, he wants to give you solutions. He wants to remind you of who you are. He wants to tell you who else to pray for. And, and he wants you to watch him move on their behalf because you prayed for them. Like, it's a real relationship with God. If you don't have that, then do what it takes to, to seek him until you find him. Because if you're genuinely seeking him, you'll find him. And then when you find him, there's no distraction. There's no distraction that is more valuable than that. Like he becomes your distraction. And it's easy if you're not disciplined. Because like I said, I wrote my book, even when I didn't feel like it, but in obedience, I did it. When we still, and I'm, and I, and I say like, I struggled with this when my book came out. This is just real talk USA right here from Jamie Lynn. I struggled with the spirit of apathy after I released my book. It's like, are you going to live your book? Are you going to spend time in the word? Are you going to spend time? And it got me into a funky mood. And how do you break it? You get in the word, even when you don't feel like it, which I'm always glad I did. And you spend time with him and listen to his heart for you because it is good, loving, and kind. And so I hope that that speaks to it, but I just feel it takes discipline. It is 100% your choice to be distracted or not. And so intentionally, even if you don't know, if you don't think you could think you're not distracted, it never hurts to ask Holy Spirit, am I distracted anywhere? Am I putting anything before you? And listen to him and then take action. You're 100% responsible for your walk with God, nobody else. And so that's my, that's, that's my black and white advice. (laughs) Well, and, and you reminded me of the, the thought I had earlier when my brain just went completely blank. Um, one of the hallmarks of a good message, in my opinion, now, <clears throat> I work in Christian publishing. I've been interviewing people for almost 10 years. So I'm not quite to a thousand interviews. I'm getting close. Wow. Um, but when somebody tells you that they live out their message or that you know they regularly return to what's in their book and it impacts their own journey, 
um, that says, okay, this is a book I should really take seriously. Because if if you write a book in you know in the conversation, I can I'm like this has no clearly yes, this is a great principle and it's encouraging and maybe a little challenging. But if you don't actually live it out, that that's concerning to me. So anytime an author tells me about how God challenged them to live out the message, uh, I get really excited because I always tell authors when they're on the front side of the writing journey, I'm just just I'm like just remember you are setting yourself up to be the poster girl or poster boy for this message. And God is going to call you to live it out. And if you don't live it out, people are going to call you on it and it's going to get really awkward. So just know um, that if you're going to write this, people are going to expect this is how you live. The other part of that is as you're writing it, usually you will go through the fire and be super challenged to live it out along the way as you're writing it. So um, I don't say that to you know dissuade people from writing books. I want people to write books. That's important. Uh-huh. Uh, but just know that you'll you'll get the opportunity to really live out that message and and be an example to others. So okay. that I was glad you said that. I was like, okay, then 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 people really should uh, take the book seriously. Um, and in, in terms of like you know we're we're in a microwave quick fix world. You know we want to just go to church and pray a prayer, and God God takes the thing away. Maybe maybe it's an addiction to social media, or we're addicted to distractedness. Um, but you talk to any great men and women of God who we see on platforms and stages and all those places, if you get them alone and have a conversation, they will tell you um, all the great thing, things in their life came out of walking through great hardship, came out of trial, and just things that took a long time to be on the journey with. And it comes out of the secret place, time alone with God, time just hearing from God, being poured into uh, from God. And so we get excited about the shiny objects. We want to be on stage. We want the attention. And I, I understand that that's attractive. Um, but to get in that place where you've got uh, the shoulders, the strength to sus- sustain it, the characters to sustain it, that comes over a long journey and a lot of time. And so sometimes it's not taking that thing away instantly. That's the point. God wants to walk on that journey with you through that hard place over the years, maybe over the decade where you learn to grow and rely on God. And it's in that really, really that travail and walking out with God. That's where the character comes. That's where the authority to maybe have a ministry that speaks into that very thing. That's where that comes from. So we all want the quick fix, but sometimes uh, the point is actually the journey where that takes a long time uh, to walk out and get healing from, get victory over. So any comments you'd like to add to any of that, Jamie, before we move on? That's so good, Sean. I, in any sphere of influence, you're building a business. They don't tell you the hard things. They're like, yeah, build a business. How much risk is involved? How much labor is involved? How much faithfulness, how much time with God for wisdom and revelation to build his way, period. Like, when, when you don't know if you're going to be able to pay the salaries of the people in your company, when you don't know if you're going to be able to pay yourself, like th- there are moments that if you lean into God, every time it's hard and every time it's good, then it does produce something. And I am not where I thought I would be today. I'm not, I don't have the following I thought I would have and hear me out, hear me out because that actually doesn't mean anything to me anymore. And, and I'll like, I really mean that. Um, the number of followers we have does not measure our success. I have learned the, my, my sound is for the remnant in the body of Christ who are going to take action and go. Not everybody's willing to get on the front lines and take off sprinting like Braveheart to fight for their country. So I'm talking to those people. Like I'm talking to the people who are willing to do what it takes for righteousness and love to win. And it's not going to be pretty. It's not easy. And so I have, I feel I've come to this place where I'm like, God, and this is so real. God, thank you that I'm where I'm at today. I feel, I personally feel very hidden. My friends are like, you are not hidden. And I'm like, no, listen to me. I feel hidden in God, no matter how seen I am down the road. I want to always feel this way because, you know, decades from now, if it takes decades to be where he's shown me and where all the prophetic words, the prophets have given me, whatever, if they're real, if they're true, then I'm not there right now. And I want to feel this hidden and protected by him. And I want to know right now when the spirit of apathy comes, am I going to do the opposite? And I'm going to read the word. Am I going to press in? Because if I don't, when that time comes, because it still could come, I'll crumble in front of everyone. And I think that's what's key is what you're saying is like, that literally is the antidote to success is you and God period, not somebody else's oil that they've stored up. That's preaching on that Sunday for you. And it sounds good. And you feel like your ears were tickled and it was great. I mean, like when it was hard for you 
and nobody was around, did you turn to him? Like, and, and then what did he, what did he say? Cause he always speaks when it's hard. He always speaks when it's hard, you know, like when you keep showing up. So I love that you said that. I think it's really profound. And I feel like I've arrived at a place where I am really grateful for what you just said, Tr- like genuinely deeply grateful for what you said. Well, and I always appreciate on the journey that God does give us those prophetic words. You know, somebody will pray for us or uh, give us a word on something. And, uh, you know, a lot of times they're like, wow, God, I, I don't know when or how. So I feel like God gives us an inkling of what he has on the horizon, what he's uh, penciled in in our book, maybe uh, our, our destiny for the future. Um, but I think it can do two things. On the one hand, it stretches us to push further or go beyond where we would go if we were just left to do it all. Uh, on our own, but I also feel like it it helps us to stay encouraged as we're on the path and progress progressing towards that. Because if we force our way out front too fast, or uh, to use a, a, an overused cliche, get the cart ahead of the horse, again, we don't often have that character. Um, we don't have the strength. We may not have the wisdom and knowledge, or the relationships, or maybe there's other things that need to be aligned outside of our own life that tie into that thing that's in the future, and so. You know, staying in that place of God's divine timing is a critical place to just stay. There, there's always, we're always moving forward, even though in the eye of the storm, sometimes we're like, God, I'm just stuck here and it's crazy. Uh, but, you know, we can be confident there's always momentum, but sometimes the momentum is happening elsewhere. It ties to our destiny, oh, good. Um, but it's not happening like right in front of us right now. So I always appreciate that God does that. And and also I find if you're, if you're in a charismatic spirit empowered culture, you'll often see the same words from different people over and over. And God, I feel like God just keeps putting it back in front of us to be like, you really did hear right. Um, and so, you know, I, I didn't grow up in a charismatic culture at all. I'm only about eight, nine years in. And so I, I just love how uh, God, you know, I won't say he's putting the carrot, dangling the carrots out in front of us. I feel like it, it helps us to stay on that path and not fall into the ditches or get stuck off on um, side pass. So I, I, that's one thing I absolutely love about just the space that I get to do, uh, life and ministry. And, um, I want to next have you talk to us about spiritual disciplines a little bit. So we've talked about the secret place and and prayer and different things, but in terms of the men and women who feel like, man, I want to be part of this holy revolution. Like what is on a day-to-day basis, what are the spiritual disciplines? And they don't have to be things you're even going after right now, but what does it look like to live this out uh, in a way that you're going to grow and move with where God is calling you to move. I could do the marketing thing and be like, go read the book. No, <laughs> um, but for free 99 right now, um, this is, this is what's crazy. It is so simple. We've been talking about it. It's listening to the Lord. Your most powerful weapon on earth. I believe wholeheartedly is prayer, which is relationship with God. It is a relationship with God. When you recognize who somebody is, and you trust them, and you love them, and you'd lay your life down for them, but you feel that way towards God, and you know he feels that way towards you, it's a game changer. When you know God goes before you, surrounds you, follows you, when you know he fills you with wisdom and revelation, when you know it's a game changer. And if you want hunger, before you, when you open your word, one of the my favorite things to do, and it makes a difference when I do it and when I don't do it, it really does. When, and I'm not trying to make a religion out of this or like, you know, like this is just what I've discovered. Uh, and I love tangible, practical things. So I'm glad you're asking this, but I will pick up my Bible and I'm like, I want to be consumed by this. God, would you consume me with your word? And God, would you speak to me today in your word? I want to live what I read and I need your help. And sometimes I literally put it on my head like a hat. I'm like, I'll literally be like, I'll be like, God consume me with this consume. Like I will do some of the weirdest things or I'll be like, I'm going to eat this like before I start reading it. And I might, so if y'all ever see me in the prayer room and I have a Bible on my head or in my, like up to my mouth, just know. But to me, it's like, I know, and that's my faith act to be like, I know when I read this, it's doing something. It's filling me with the most nourishing, long lasting oil that will burn. If I'm a lamp, this is the oil. And it's the only way I can keep going. And so I would say prayer and I would say reading the word and then worship. Like when you worship God, like I think one of the biggest things that Americans specifically need to know, and I know I'm sure your podcast reaches beyond America. So hear me out for anybody, but this is a big spiritual dynamic over America is me, myself, and I. 
And if you can worship and look to him and t- not like you make me strong, you make me this, that's praise. I'm talking about like, God, you are faithful. You're true. You never lie. You've, you've always like, you, you're the victor. Like you never lose you. You are. And you start telling him all these things that he is. Everything starts to shift. Your atmosphere starts to shift and you begin to pray with such faith, if you can do that, even, even when you start praying, you start telling him who he is and thanking him for who he is and then stop praying for yourself all the time. <laughs> like, stop praying for your situation all the time because you're making it an idol. Sometimes, sometimes we can make it an idol by just, God, I need you. I need, I don't know what to do here. I just need you. Da, 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 da. And that's all you're like, you're consumed by the situation and the problem rather than by faith, knowing he's going to talk to you about it in his timing. Like you were talking about earlier. I think that's, that's what I would say. So one relationship with God prayer Two, um, reading his word three worship and four, when you do all these things, making sure you're doing it for others and not just yourself and that you're, you're listening in the process. That to me is the most tangible way to get hungry. Well, I like what you shared about kind of wearing God's word as a hat. I mean, (laughs) where sometimes God will bring us into this time of whether we're compelled or he's asking us to kind of do what we would maybe sometimes label as a prophetic act. You know, it can look like all sorts of different things Uh, in a public setting. It can look kind of weird and awkward, but if you're getting an impression to lay down in worship or go up into the front by the altar or um, you know, my prayers, you all can be in a church setting where that's welcomed and celebrated in yeah, it's a little bit awkward at first. And once you kind of t- take that first step a few times, uh, you'll you'll get a little bit more comfortable just stepping out and doing something that maybe not everybody else is doing. But um, what I've found through the years is as we do that, we're aligning our physical reality with the spiritual reality. And sometimes just as we step out in faith and bring those two together, amazing things happen. And so it's a little weird. It's a little uncomfortable at first. Uh, mm-hmm. But those, what again, what I would label as a prophetic act of, bringing into alignment what God's doing in the spirit with what's happening in the physical, uh, there's just something really powerful uh, in that. And so my encouragement would be as, as you're feeling compelled or God is encouraging you to do these things, just step out and see what shifts and sh- see what happens. I think you might really be surprised at what God's going to reveal to you or how that's going to, for whatever reason, propel you into that next thing, that next place. So take a risk. If you take a risk, I want to hear about it. So <laughs> leave a comment, send a note. Uh, we'd love to hear about that. Um, almost time to wrap up the interview, but uh, a couple more questions to go. Um, you know, one of the, the wants, the hopes, the dreams of people who are coming up today is they want to be an influencer and they, you know, Oh, I want to be a YouTube star and all these things, um, for men and women who are involved in the Holy revolution, the movement that you were starting, Jamie, what does it look like to be an influencer of culture, uh, both in what we say and what we do, uh, to really influence culture. It has to look like something there has to be momentum. Um, so how do we do that? What does that look like? I love that you're asking this. Um, if you can't influence the world in prayer, if you can't pray something when nobody's looking and see it happen, you're sure as goodness gracious, not going to see it happen on a platform. If you aren't seeing signs and miracles and you're wanting to walk in healing when you're not on a platform, you're sure not going to see it manifest when you're on a platform. Like, you want to be an influencer. The only way to be an influencer is to recognize your place. And when you recognize your place on the earth, you're willing to serve the most overlooked person in the room. You're willing to not look at how many people have liked your post and find value and, and, and to measure that as valuable. Like the most influential people in the world could have the smallest following on social media, but what they're doing and not showing everybody on social media is far more impactful. And that's another thing I want to share with people who are tuning in. There's a reward for things done in secret. There are many things that I will never share on social media about giving about my time and what I put it to about X, Y, Z. You will never see things on social media because I want the jewels in heaven. I want the crown and I don't ever want those things that are done with love um, to be done, to be seen because it would be easy to, to transport, to, to be an influencer. I want, I want to influence people, but really I want more following because that's what the world measures as success and influencers in the world have a large following. That's how it would be defined. 
but an influencer in the kingdom of heaven? Are you looking around you and seeing that people are knowing God more and you're discipling people? Are you making disciples? Are you making disciples? And then are you teaching them how to make disciples? That is an influencer. So when nobody's looking and you're seeing things happen in the prayer room, he will always, always, if you are to be a quote unquote influencer on social media, you will become one because he'll show you how, but please don't do it before it's time. And, and then I would just say like, are you making this, are you living the great commission and teaching people to obey his word? Are you obeying his word when nobody's looking? And do you even know his word enough to know if you're obeying it? Like, these are the questions that I would ask somebody. And so that is what I would say. Like, I feel for everyone tuning in, he wants to be an influencer because that is what the world has told you is valuable. But an influencer in the kingdom of heaven is laying down your life for other people to know him, not for, not for, not laying down your and compromising so that you can have a large following because it's one or the other. It's not, does that make sense? Yes. Yes. That makes total sense. Um, one, one more thread I want to pull on, uh, the idea of serving others has come up or serving in, in different capacities, sometimes behind the scenes. Um, I got to interview John Bevere eh, about a year ago. And one of the things that came up in our conversation was um, we've both seen men and women, young leaders get out front before they were ready and, and they get crushed because they just they, they didn't have what they needed to sustain what was really being thrust upon them. They're very gifted, but they didn't really have all the things they needed to be in that place yet. And he, he talked about one of the things that was really pivotal in his journey that really spoke to me was serving an older leader for like seven years, even though he wanted to be out front fast and it, you, you really want attention, you want to be noticed. It's, it's in that, that uh, length of service that there are all those things that are caught, but not taught where, you know, where we're mentored by somebody learning from somebody over a long period of time. And that's, that's really, really important. I feel like that's something that we've kind of lost in a lot of places today where um, it's not exciting to always be serving um, but it's often in the midst of those behind the scenes places where we're, you know, working the t-shirt table and setting up the tables and chairs and all the things. Um, that's when some of those biggest lessons, those life changing lessons come about. And so um, I'd love for you to just speak a little bit, Jamie, to um, especially, you know, really in any generation, because we're always we're almost always serving somebody. And there's often somebody serving our own vision as we're kind of going along the path. But talk to us a little bit about the importance of serving and maybe what God wants to teach us in the midst of that. Well, I love this. This is in my book. There's a section about serving and the importance of the heart posture of serving. Um, I love that you and John talked about this. I just love this interview. You're asking amazing questions, by the way. You really are. Um, they're not like these stereotypical questions. Serving is like, it's hard because there's so many examples I want to give, but then it's like awkward because you're like, do I give these or not? Like, do I just hold these in my heart or not? Um, I feel, you know, my husband and I moved back recently. Like I am called to media and I'm not like a behind this. Like I don't understand like a lot behind the scenes of like the technical side of media. And I feel called to be in front of camera, but I also can do things behind the scenes where I do media and social media for other people. Right. Well, um, I would say to people who are tuning in, if you are not serving, if you look at your life and you're like, and this is another thing, ask the Holy Spirit, where am I serving right now? Am I serving my family? Like, do my parents need help every week? Am I serving my grandparents? Like, it doesn't have to be at a church, by the way. Like, I don't think the church, the church to me is not inside the four walls of something with the word church on the outside. The church is you in the city, you, wherever you feel called to serve. And so I actually um, served on the media team this past year at a church that my husband and I were going to behind camera. And it was uncomfortable for me, but I felt I was to serve there because I knew it was not just a need, but I knew I could learn another aspect and have respect and adoration and appreciation for people who would be doing that for me one day, which I'm not there yet, but I'm saying one day, it was important to me to serve. And I'm not too, important. Like I travel and I preach and I, I, I mean, hear me out. It would be easy for me to be like, I am, I am a speaker. Why would I serve here? You know, but it's like, no, I felt like that's where I was called to serve. Um, and so I stepped in and I served there for a year before, you know, we're, we're looking for another place 
right now for where the season that God's called us to be in. And, and I remember even like, you know, like, are you willing to stay after and clean up? Are you willing to pick up the trash? Do you recognize the trash on the floor when you're walking down the street? Do you pick it up and throw it away? Do you recognize the trash in the church? Do you pick it up and throw it away? Like, are, are you willing to do what most, are you willing to clean the toilets? Because I can guarantee you that if I had a million people following me on social media and I was the highest paid speaker in the world, I'd still be willing to clean toilets. Like if you're, you're above that, there's a problem. That's a heart issue. That's not like, like serving to me is, am I always willing to clean the toilets? Am I always willing to do X, Y, Z? And I'm not talking about serving people who have a big name, because I think that can also be misconstrued. You can do that, but ask the Holy Spirit who you're to serve and serve without any anticipation of anything in return, other than knowing that you believe in them. And I believe that we do reap what we sow. And I believe when you learn to serve people beautifully, that one day people will come alongside you and serve the vision that God has given you as well. But that doesn't mean you stop serving. Like, I just think serving is such a heart posture. It's so important if you're not doing it and you're not able to look at one way you can serve people. Like you can buy somebody's coffee behind you. Like you can, like you can do so many things to serve in tiny different ways all throughout your day. Pray for people when they're not around. Pray for the people you see people that you love and you want to be like them, be like them, quote unquote. Pray for them. Pray for their journey. Pray for protection. They need prayers. Are you willing to pray for these people that you feel called to do what they're doing? And that's a great way of serving when nobody's looking. So all that to say, you know, you don't need to become the assistant of the person you want to be like, but that doesn't mean you can't serve them in some way with your gift. What gift can you bring for free, serving for free. That doesn't mean you need to get paid to do what you're doing. So, so much I could say. Honestly, feel like it's more thought out and beautiful in this book. Holy Revolution. If you want more on serving, read Jamie Lynn's book. It's it's all in there for you. It's a big again, deal. again, great marketing. I love this. Uh, you know, Jamie Lynn. Whether it's this this conversation or people go out, they pick up the book, they get all the way through, close that back flap, like. What's the takeaway? How do you hope you've impacted people? How should their life be different on that other side of encountering your message? Hunger. I, you know, Patricia told me, and I, and this is stuck with me. And so I get to share it with other people. It's like, when you encounter God, oftentimes that has to do with your call and your anointing that you're to release on earth. So for me, I've encountered the fear of God by hearing his voice, like audibly crazy and this encounter holiness. And so there's an authority that I feel is carried in this message by the spirit of God that can only be taught by the anointing, which we read about in first John, the anointing teaches you, you know, like I'm living this. And so I believe that there's the feedback I've been getting from this is just the hunger and that people want to go back and read it, that this is a book, you know, my friend Lana Vosser was like, this is a book. It's like a toolkit. Like people will go back and read this book um, to stir hunger because there's practical nuggets for you to walk away with. And there's prophetic insight to what's coming and what will be required of us to accomplish what God wants to do beyond what is coming in the world. And so I think hunger and practical ways to walk it out. Like I, I and you, uh, hopefully you feel like we're sitting at coffee together and you don't feel like that you feel the presence of God and that you feel like Jamie Lynn is sitting in the room with you while you're reading it. And Jamie Lynn, I know people are going to want to connect with you, find out more. You've got a podcast, you do a wide range of media related stuff. So uh, give us a little insight into some of the places we can encounter your content. And then in terms of website, uh, social media, where do we discover you on the web? Um, I do have a podcast called Set Apart with Jamie Lynn Well Now, and that is about to relaunch again for season three. And then we have the Next America Show, which is getting ready to relaunch, which is all about solutions in what we need in the Next America by people who are living this message. And then we have jamielynnwallnow.com or Jamie Lynn Wallnow, Jamie Lynn with one in on all social media, my website, all that. If you go to jamielynnwallnow.com, you can find anything that you want to find. And like we do with every episode, we'll have links in the show notes so you can connect with Jamie Lynn and pick up your very own copy of her new book as well. It's time to bring this episode of the Sean Tabbitt Show to a close. 
Many thanks for being a part of my conversation with Jamie Lynn Wallnow. Once again, our book today was Holy Revolution, Finding True Satisfaction in a Life Set Apart. Jamie Lynn, it's been a blast chatting with you. Thanks so much for sharing with us today. I greatly appreciate it. Thank you.